15 of the most important investing laws according to the greatest investors of all time. Let's go. Warren Buffett says the most important decision you'll ever make has nothing to do with your money or your career. Of course, he's talking about your spouse. And I am incredibly lucky because my spouse, Natalie, she enables me to do great things. She pushes me and is a very good influence on me, but my spouse could just as easily have been a very bad influence, holding me back throughout my entire life. However, Warren Buffett isn't quite right, and Natalie is not gonna wanna hear this, but your spouse is only your second most important investment, right behind health. Without my health, I could lose everything, even my spouse. You know what they say, put on your own oxygen mask before you help other people put on theirs. By maximizing my health and investing in my health while I'm young, I'll have a sharper mind and a stronger body. I'll have more success with my investing journey and I'll be healthier for longer, meaning I'll be able to enjoy my successes much longer. So health for me is the number one investment. And now we got the cheesy ones out of the way. Let's get into the next law. According to Warren Buffett, preserve capital. The first rule on in investment is don't lose. And the second rule on investment is don't forget the first rule. And that's all the rules there are. Don't lose money sounds like kind of a jokey piece of advice to give, but behind the surface, there is some hidden wisdom. And that is to not be overly enchanted by the potential upside of an investment, but to equally weight the potential downside. For instance, Bitcoin, it could replace fiat currency. It could be absolutely huge. However, it could also be replaced by another cryptocurrency that's more efficient, a little bit better. It's a great reminder to me to really weigh in my mind the potential downsides because after all, a 50% loss requires a 100% gain just to break even once again. Losses can be even more costly than gains are productive for your portfolio. The next law helps me to limit my downside by thinking like an owner. And you have to have the attitude that you're buying part of a business and not that you're buying something that wiggles around on a chart or that has resistance zones or 200 day moving averages or that you buy puts or calls on or anything like that. You're buying part of a business. Warren Buffett does not care about the short term movements of the stock, the supply lines or the resistance lines. What he looks at is what are the fundamentals of the business? Am I buying a business that is strong? Because over the short term, yes, the market is unreliable and unpredictable. But over the long term, the market will properly weigh the value of a company. And if I'm buying a part of a business, I can be more confident that over the long term, I'm going to have positive results. And one way that I can be sure that I am buying strong businesses is following the next rule of investing, which is stick to your process. Sticking to a system allows me to avoid making emotional decisions. I like to set up a limit sell and a stop loss. That way, if a stock is ripping up or crashing down, I'm not vulnerable in that moment to making a, an emotional decision, one that is not optimal for my portfolio. Also, sticking to a system when buying a stock helps to compare companies apples to apples. For instance, I'm looking at investing in NVIDIA. I'm also looking at Home Depot. In the end, all that matters is the total returns. So I'm not going to be overly enchanted by the potential upside of NVIDIA. I'm going to stay disciplined, which is the next law for investing, according to Peter Lynch. And the key organ in your body in the stock market is your stomach. It's not the brain. The most important organ in my investing body is my stomach. And I have to have a great stomach on both the buy and the sell. For instance, I don't want to rush into a bad investment because it's much better to be late into a great investment. And then when the stock market is crashing, I've got to have the stomach to hold onto my shares, not sell at the worst time, because I know in the long term, the stock market tends to go up. The next law of investing helps to make it easier to hold stock through a crash, and that is build an emergency fund. Markets are going down, and you have your livelihood at risk. It's very difficult to be rational. So key is getting yourself to a place where you're financially secure. Stock market crashes are heavily correlated with increases in unemployment. There is nothing worse than if I lost my job and then I've got to sell my losing stocks at the worst time just to pay my rent or keep the lights on or put gas in the car. So having that emergency fund really makes it possible to stick to my investments even when they're temporarily, hopefully temporarily, at the bottom. Having an emergency fund doesn't only keep me from selling, it also gives me the confidence to buy, which is the next law of investing buy when others are fearful. You have to get excited when things get cheaper and you got to get 
concern when things get more expensive. The periods immediately following a market crash have historically had some of the best returns. And that is because with increased risk, generally correlates with increased returns. You're not going to get good performance long term out of bonds compared to the stock market. For instance, over the last 100 years, diversified bond fund, if you invested $1,000 in 1919, in 2019, it would turn into $9,000. While during that same amount of time, starting with that same amount of money, investing in the stock market would turn into 2.2 million. Over the long term, I can be confident that the stock market is going to go up in general and my portfolio is gonna go up as long as I follow the next law of investing, which is diversify your holdings. You don't get that much more benefit of diversification going from a dozen to 25 or even 50. You know, most of the benefits of diversification come in the first, you know, call it 10 or 12. This one's a little bit counterintuitive. Bill Hackman points out that you don't actually want too many holdings. If you have 50, 100 companies that you're invested in, that's gonna lock you into average return. If you're chasing above average returns, you only need 10 or 12 to get the benefits of diversification, which is having companies that are not heavily correlated that are exposed to different market sectors. For instance, if I had all my money invested in horses and carriages 200 years ago, I would be in trouble now. I want to make sure that my holdings are properly diversified amongst the different sectors that way I can get access to those long-term solid returns. That being said, I have to be honest with my skills and with my time. If I'm gonna go after above average returns, then I have to have more responsibility when I'm selecting stocks. Real quick, if you're enjoying the video, please do me this one small favor and hit the like button. It makes a big difference for my channel. I would really appreciate it. And I'll continue to do my part and make better and better content. Back to the video. I have to follow the next law of investing, which is understand your investment. People are in industries. They're in the publishing industry. They're in the chemical industry, the paper. Why don't they just stay with an industry? You only need a few stocks a decade. How many good stocks do you need in a lifetime? <laughs> Instead of people, they're in the restaurant industry. They're buying biotechnology stocks, right. oil stocks. Right. It's absolutely absurd. <laughs> people don't understand their natural advantages yeah. and they don't use them. Simple and understandable businesses in my circle of competence are going to be much more realistic targets for me to roughly predict the long-term trajectory of that company. In the short term, the stock market is all over the place, but in the long term, it will realistically and accurately weigh these companies for the direction that they're headed. If a company is truly strong and it's growing over the long term, the stock market will evaluate that. However, I have to be realistic with myself. If I do not have the time or the expertise to correctly and realistically evaluate a company, then I need to follow the next law of investing, which is buy low cost, high quality ETFs or index funds. When I don't have the time or the expertise, investing in ETFs is the way to go. Just getting average market returns will make me rich. The S&P 500, for instance, averages 10% annualized per year. If I invested $1,000 per month, starting at the age of 18, I would have $1.5 million by the time I was 45 years old. This is really good. Now, it gets better and better the earlier you start, which is the next law of investing, invest early. Think of the value of compounding. Get yourself out a little compound interest table and see that at 7%, money doubles every 10 years, and then it doubles again, and then it doubles again, and then it doubles again, and doubles again, and doubles again. And by the time you're at retirement age, if you start investing when you're 50, it's multiplied, you don't have to tell me, but let me say uh, 35 or 40 times over. Unbelievable, maybe even more than that. The power of compounding really only comes into play when you take advantage of it for long periods of time. That first example, investing from 18 to 45 got us 1.5 million. If you go another 20 years, you're not going up to 3 million, you're going up to 11 million. The rate of increase just accelerates and accelerates. And the next law of investing helps me to continue to take advantage of it, which is invest often. I like to automate my savings. I have direct deposit set up. So directly from my paycheck, I've got money that goes into my 401k. It automatically invests in low cost, high quality, diversified ETFs. I've got direct deposit going into my brokerage account, which I like to use to invest in individual companies when I have the time and I have the confidence that I can accurately evaluate said company. And this happens for me every single week. I don't have to think about it. And this helped me not to break the next law of investing, which is don't time the market. You can, they're economic facts and it's economic predictions. 
And economic predictions are a total waste. And uh, interest rates, Alan Greenspan is a very honest guy. He would tell you that he can't predict interest rates. He could tell you what short rates are going to do in the next six months. Try and stick them on what the long-term rate will be three years from now. They'll say, I don't have any idea. So how are you, the investors, supposed to predict interest rates if the head of Federal Reserve can't do it? Even Peter Lynch, one of the greatest investors of all time, does not bother timing the market. He knows that time in the market is superior, and that's because market returns are incredibly concentrated on just a handful of trading days. It's very unlikely for me to pick the handful of days where the market gets the bulk of its returns. It's much better for me to just have my money in there the whole time. That way I can be sure that I'm invested on all of those trading days. If I think something is gonna cause a crash, the market's already aware, it's probably already priced in. I have to be very careful about thinking that I can predict a market trend because the next law of investing is avoid the obvious. If something is truly obvious to me, then the market probably already knows about it. We live in the age of information and the pools of smart money are getting bigger and bigger. Billions of dollars are changing hands as insiders have access to information way before the masses. So if the masses are all talking about something, then it's probably already priced in. I try to stay laser focused on my own analysis. What do I put the intrinsic value of a company at? And I ignore what everybody else is saying. That being said, calculating the intrinsic value of a company will never be perfect, but it will get me pretty close, especially if it's an easy to understand business within my circle of competence. In this video, I share my basic techniques and calculations for determining the intrinsic value of a company. If you're interested, check it out. I'll catch you on the flip side.